first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, meeting. Um, it's a very short presentation, and I'm going to concentrate on mainly one aspect, which is the neurological aspect of the antiphospholipid syndrome. Next slide, please. Um, we're beginning to know much more about how important this antiphospholipid syndrome is in internal medicine. And there is now evidence that the media, as in this newspaper headline, also um, are getting to know more about the antiphospholipid syndrome. We're getting, for example, dozens of requests now about thrombosis uh, in the COVID affected patients, but uh, I'll come back to the other aspects in a minute. Next slide, please. For me, the history of this syndrome goes back to when I was a fellow under Dr. Charles Christian uh, in New York in 1969 to 70, outstanding boss and leader. And he, he really got me interested in lupus. Next slide, please. Um, my first paper on the brain aspect in lupus was a series we wrote back in 1977, Brain Reactivity of Lymphocytotoxic Antibodies in SLE. And, and we showed, as did Zweifler and colleagues in America, that there were some antibodies demonstrable in lupus, which uh, seemed to go with cerebral involvement. We we're very excited by this. And we spent years working on this aspect of the brain in lupus. Next slide, please. This is one of my early fellows when I was back in London, Aziz Garabi, who was, uh, to my mind, a genius in the lab. And uh, I put a picture of him independently because sadly he, he's died, but one of my greatest fellows. Next slide, please. We became very interested in the lupus clinic in uh, what has now become the antiphospholipid syndrome. And we realized that there was a subset of lupus in fact, after that, a subset of patients with no lupus, but with just the clotting and other features of an APS. In 1982, uh, this was the first presentation of the antiphospholipid syndrome, and it was given to the British Society of Rheumatology. It was called the Hebberden Round, and in those days, you uh, had patients who gave messages about the aspects of the disease. Now, these were all patients with lupus, but three of them uh, had differences. But one had migraine and intermittent thrombocytopenia. Another girl, third from the right, she looks Cushingoid, but she was wrongly treated originally for lupus nephritis, but it was thrombosis. She had bilateral renal vein thrombosis and uh, little else for lupus. Next slide, please. In 1983, we published our first big papers on the subject uh, in the BMJ, in October 83. Next slide, please. Uh, in the Lancet, a paper which Nigel Harris and Aziz Garabi, uh, Dr. Bowie, Patel, Macrath, Young, Loizu were all fellows. And this was the, uh, the antiphospholipid radioimmunoassay, which is still used to, to this day. Next slide, please. Um, in 1983, I gave a, a lecture to the British Society of Dermatology called Connective Tissue Disease of the Skin. And this is the paper, although it's in a small print journal, where I describe most of the clinical features. Next slide, please. These included um, thrombosis, spontaneous abortions, often multiple, neurologic disease, thrombocytopenia, and levido reticularis. Also migraine, epilepsy, Bud Chiari syndrome, and renovascular hypertension were all described for the clinical features of the syndrome. Next slide, please. These are, I've, slide, I've shown this slide meetings before, but uh, these are colleagues and friends, uh, I know some of whom are here today, who, who really um, put this syndrome on the map over the last 20, 30 years. In the center is uh, Muntha Kamashta, who who has been my law right-hand man for the last, once I will tell you, 20 years at, at St. Thomas's. Next slide, please. Richard Severa, who is presenting with me in this meeting. So we now know that this is a major cause, a treatable cause of recurrent miscarriages. And this is one of the headlines in the paper. And in many ways, naturally, the obstetric world has been the first to take on this syndrome in a very big way. Next slide, please. 
Uh, I've made this slide for teaching undergraduates, really, or students, uh, many, many publications, but there is a very rough average of one in five. For instance, positive tests are reported in five, one in five DVTs, critically one in five young under 40 strokes, one in five idiopathic teenage epilepsy, one in five recurrent miscarriage, and one in five myocarditis cardinal infarction in women under 40. So the impact in all aspects of medicine has been profound. Next slide, please. It's 38 years old since we described the clinical features, but having shown those successes, I think it's still an underdiagnosed syndrome. Next slide, please. And I just want to show four slides very quickly, giving the examples of how it may be under underutilized. Next slide, please. This is a paper from China in lupus, in our series Lupus Around the World. 911 patients, thrombocytopenia, pulmonary hypertension, but no mention of antiphospholipid testing. Next slide, please. This is a paper uh, two years ago, white matter lesions in lupus. They reported on 70 lupus patients, 25 controls, and the white matter lesions lesions were commoner in SLE. <clears throat> no mention of antiphospholipid testing. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and thirdly, um, pulmonary hypertension in Sjogren's, a big Chinese study, they found a very strong association in their study with thrombocytopenia, which you would imagine some of whom had positive antiphospholipid, but zero. Next slide, please. And last of all, this sort of article. This was sent into the British Medical Journal, sending blood samples, samples for antiphospholipid tests. They rarely lead anywhere because unfortunately, there's little useful treatment other than warfarin for those who've had venous events. Wrong, next slide please. So finally, next slide please. In the last few minutes, I want to just report on my own particular main interest in this syndrome. And that is, I think that the antiphospholipid syndrome is a new chapter in neurology and possibly a major chapter. Next slide, please. In that BMJ paper in 83, we described cerebrovascular accidents, sometimes transient, but frequently progressive. And stroke is the major worry, of course, of this syndrome. Next slide, please. Um, many patients have normal MRIs. We are still working in, in the whole world of antiphospholipid on more sensitive assays other than these white dots. Next slide, please. This is a paper by Shahari and in lupus. They looked at white matter lesions in SLE, and they looked at different factors, including age, active disease, lupus nephritis. But the one associated factor which stood out was the antiphospholipid test, positive uh, with a p-value of 0 0.004. Next slide, please. I just remind you of the, the cost of stroke. This is a paper I picked up from the American literature, the cost of stroke, 795 in the US each year. One out of all deaths of 20, one out of 20 deaths, I'm sorry. Nine out of 10 strokes are ischemic. And the cost is put down now as 34 billion each year. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a paper from colleagues not far from here. The cutaneous manifestations are significantly related to cerebrovascular in a Serbian cohort of patients with Hughes syndrome. A paper by uh, uh, Ludmilla and by Dr. Djokovic and colleagues. Next slide, please. And what they reported quite uh, convincingly was our insights bring cutaneous manifestations of APS particularly livido, to the position of significant markers of cerebrovascular events. Next slide, please. Of course, other factors in some patients lead to infarct. And headache and migraine, in my view, are one of the three major features of the antiphospholipid syndrome. They often start in teenage years and go away and then come back. They're often, interestingly, run in families and they do respond to anticoagulation in many, many patients. Next slide, please. Um, this paper shows 
uh, again, how antiphospholipid is strongly associated 4.8 times higher than control uh, in patients with antiphospholipid antibodies and migraine. Next slide, please. And lastly, on migraine, uh, this is a paper by Imad Uthman and his colleague, um, colleagues um, saying, suggesting that APS revisited, would migraine headaches be included in future classification criteria? I think so, but uh, we'll wait and see. Next slide, please. Just to put a financial thing on it, uh, this is just one forecast from a Japanese drug forecast. By 2023, the migraine market will grow by $3.7 million. Next slide, please. We came across an unexpected finding. We did describe epilepsy in lupus associated with APL. But a major review by Neuraldine really says it all, that the Hughes syndrome is associated with epilepsy. Next slide, please. Individuals with positive APL tests were found to be 11 times more likely to have seizures than patients negative for these antibodies. Next slide, please. I think in the epilepsy world, temporal lobe epilepsy is a common feature. And I think it's underdiagnosed at this time. Next slide. Sleep disturbance is now being reported. We, we really don't know how major uh, or how significant numerically this is in our APS patients. Next slide, please. And finally, neuropathy, commoner I think in APS than in straight lupus. And more recently, the neuropathy has involved the autonomic nervous system with POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Next slide, please. In the paper, uh, this, sorry, this is the features of POTS, tachycardia on standing, palpitation, headaches, diarrhea, fainting. And to make matters more complex, some cases are associated with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and in our experience have been associated also with Sjogren's. So the ripples spread of the features of antiphospholipid syndrome. Next slide, please. We described with Julia Schofield from Denver, 14 cases of POTS in patients with APS and, and Hughes syndrome. And anecdotally, some of the patient's anti anti neuronal antibody syndrome, if you like, improved with anticoagulants, something which has not been seen in any other treatment of POTS to this date. Next slide, please. Lastly, the commonest cause of trouble in APS, I think, is memory and brain fog. Next slide, please. Patients have difficulty in word finding, remembering names, and in many patients are concerned that they might have Alzheimer's disease. And I want to end with just an example of anticoagulation. Next slide, please. Of anticoagulation. A number of years ago, we found that giving heparin helped the headache and memory loss. For instance, those women on heparin for nine months of pregnancy often had no headache and felt that their memory loss was sharp. Their memory was sharper during that time. Next slide, please. We feel that this is a safe trial and we tend to give two to three weeks of Fragmin self-administered daily. And for those in the sharp end of treating patients, it's a major, major jump to go from aspirin to, for instance, warfarin. You have colleagues breathing down your neck. But here I think you have a fairly safe heparin trial. And the patient comes back either saying no good or very good indeed. You get a clear indication of what's going on. Next slide, please. And this slide I show because it really is a dramatic case report. This young woman in her late 20s had severe APS with severe memory loss, was on aspirin, not responding. The left-hand column shows her memory down at the 18th percentile. Three weeks later, she was rechecked by our psychiatry department with her fancy tests. She was up at the 90% range. And our professor of psychiatry said, no psychiatric drug does anything like that. Next slide, please. So two lessons to end with. Um, in the world of internal medicine, 
APS, I think, is a major disease, not just in all aspects, but specifically in neurological disease. And I predict that this will become a bigger and bigger subject as the decade goes on. And the second and final lesson, next slide, please, is in the world of lupus. A patient with seizures, stroke, movement disorders or memory loss, think of APS, because in my experience, uh, these tend to point towards the possibility of associated APS, and of course, critically important uh, in the management of those patients. Next slide, please. So to Dennis Wall, Ricard Severa, Alexander Dokovic and Ludmila Stojanovic, and all of you in the APS European uh, Forum. Next slide, please. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.